Can anyone tell me what term survives from left, right, or front, back? Yes, what do you get for left, right? The X, the Y, the Z times? Good. Do you have the next term? What's the next term? The DYD? Good. Absolutely. Okay, guys, so um, some of you have finished. If you haven't finished, keep going. I think this is a very good exercise for you to get straight. From the remaining two terms, that's all that survives. So if we sum these three terms together, you can see dx, dy, dz is common. So we will get dx, dy, dz. And then what do we have left? dbz, dz, plus dvx, dx, plus dvy, dy. What is that thing in square brackets? Divergence, absolutely. This is the divergence of V. So this is the x dy dz times the divergence of V. Good. What is dx dy dz? The volume of the box. So in actual fact, because this is a very small box, Usually we would break a big volume up into little volumes, right? But this is such a small box that the entire volume is one little box. So this we can write as the integral of the divergence of V, d volume. How do you want to write d volume? D, e, maybe I'll write 3R. Happy with that? Good. So, Let's uh, summarize what have we proved. That's what we've proved. Now, you asked a question about the sign of DA. So on this side, we're taking DA to point outside. If you pick dA to point inside, there would have been a minus sign on that side. Okay? But you would still have had a, a perfectly good mathematical result. Okay. So we've proved this now for a small box. We would like to prove this now for a finite size box, a big box. Who can suggest the strategy? Break it into small boxes. Absolutely. Perfect. So I'm not going to take a very big box. So here's one of our small boxes. Okay. And um, here's another one of our small boxes. These boxes are so small that for each of them separately, I can use this result. Okay? So if I take this small box and I integrate V over the surface of that box, that will be equal to the integral of the divergence of V over the volume of that box. For this little box too, if I integrate V over the surface of the box, the answer I get is equal to the integral of the divergence of V over the volume of the box. Now let me think of a box that is twice as big. Is the volume of the box on the top equal to the volume of the box? Is the, is the volume of the big box equal to the volume of the little box at the top plus the little box at the bottom? 
So integrating over the volume of the big box is the same as integrating over the volume of the top box plus integrating over the volume of the little box at the bottom. Everyone happy with that? But now, if I integrate over the surface of the big box, there's a piece at the top, there's a piece at the bottom, there's a piece on the side, a piece on the side, a piece at the front, and a piece at the back. Okay? That's if I integrate over the surface of the big box. If I integrate over the surface of this little box, there's a piece at the top that also belongs to the big box. The pieces on the side, those also belong to the big box. At the front and the back also belong to the big box. But this is extra. That piece at the bottom does not belong to the big box. And I'm thinking about the box at the bottom. Well, those sides are shared with the big box, but that piece at the top is extra. So now when I do the surface integral, I've got that piece extra, and I've got this piece extra. Do I have to worry about that? No. Why? Why do they cancel? You point outside. So for when I'm integrating over this side of the box, my dA points down. When I'm integrating over this piece of the box, dA points up. So the contribution from this side when integrating over the top box exactly cancels the contribution from this side when integrating over the bottom box. So integrating over the surface of this box plus integrating over the surface of this box is the same as integrating over the surface of the big box. Everyone happy? Integrating over the volume of this little box plus integrating over the volume of that little box is equal to the integrating over the volume of the bigger box. Everyone happy? So I can immediately take that result and promote it to a big size because I can just keep adding boxes until I've got a big volume. Is everyone happy with that? So it's very, very similar to what we did with the Stokes theorem. Sides that are shared now land up not contributing. So in fact, we can assume that this holds now for the big box. This is called <coughs> the divergence theorem. Now, here, I have to integrate over some area A, and here, I need to integrate over some volume V. And let's think about how those are related. Here's my box. The area A is the surface of the box, right? The volume V is inside the box. If I say to you, where's the edge of the box? So imagine, imagine this room is the box. Okay? And I say to you, where's the edge of the box? Well, I'm going to walk to this side, and this is one edge of the box. I can't keep walking because I've hit the edge of the box now. Uh, there's the edge of the box. I can't go further down because there's the edge of the box. There's the edge of the box at the ceiling. So the surface that we're integrating over is the edge of the box. It is the boundary of the box. So this area A is the boundary of V. Everyone happy with that? That's how they're related. A is the boundary of V. I want you to remember that in Stokes' theorem, we also had a closed integral. This was over some path C of V dot dx, and this was related to an area integral of the curl of V dot dA. C is the boundary of A. This is the boundary of that. This is the boundary of that. On this side we have a derivative acting. 
On that side, we have a derivative active. So you, can you see all of the similarities between these two formulas? In fact, a mathematician working in differential geometry would call both of those Stokes' theorem. And there's a much more general version of Stokes' theorem, which doesn't just relate line integrals to surface integrals. It can relate integrals over uh, P volume to, to integrals over the boundary of that volume. Okay, so it might, you might use it in eight dimensions or something like that. So the integral of something over an eight-dimensional manifold can be related to something being integrated over the boundary of that eight-dimensional manifold. So there's a much um, more general version of Stokes' theorem than what we've done here, but you can start to see some hints of it coming through already uh, because of the similarity between these two formulas. Um, the direction of dA comes from the path C. Here again, you have a relationship between the directions because dA points, dA here points outside, but what do you mean by outside? Well, you are integrating over the inside. Okay? So again, the two directions on the two sides of the equation are correlated with each other. So that now gives us the divergence theorem. Are there any questions on either of the integral theorems that we have derived? Good. Then, yep? Uh, so far we've been talking about boxes and square. What about the uh, uh, sphere? And OK, great. So good question. So we've always limited ourselves to talking about boxes or little squares and things like that. Should that worry us? Well, if you take some arbitrarily complicated shape, if I pick my boxes small enough, I can always build any arbitrarily complicated shape out of small enough boxes. Even if you want the curve to vary smoothly, okay, if, I'm, if I take the limit that the volume of my box goes to zero, I can build any shape with these extremely small boxes. So that's the idea. We've always thought about these boxes, but you should really imagine at the end, we're always going to take a limit that the volume of the box tends to zero, and then we can build up any shape that we'd like out of these little boxes. Are you happy with that? Good. I, I guess if we were mathematicians and, and doing a mathematics course, and it's good that someone does this, okay? This needs to be done. We would look very carefully and ask ourselves, does the limit exist? Do things converge? Does it make sense? And all of that should be done before you can really claim that you've derived uh, a result. Okay? Good. Good question. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, I assume you can also verify that the Taylor approximation is in case enough. Absolutely. So, so what you can do is, so you might ask yourself, you know, if you're worried, you, you say, you know, we calculated things, and uh, we could have gone, we went to first order in the Taylor expansion. You say, we could have gone to second order in the Taylor expansion. What would happen? Well, if we went to second order in the Taylor expansion, there's an extra epsilon that creeps in. And what you would find is, in the limit where you let epsilon tend to zero, all of those extra terms vanish. Okay? The same as we pick to evaluate our vector field at the midpoint of each little segment. If you pick to evaluate it anywhere else on the segment, then for smooth vector fields, all of those things would give the same answer in the limit. For our boxes, we pick to evaluate the value of the vector field in the middle of the box. If you pick to evaluate it anywhere else on the box, that would also be fine. In the limit that the size of the box goes to zero, things won't depend on that choice. Okay? Good. All right. Um, I was going to squeeze in one more thing, but uh, maybe let's do it tomorrow properly. We won't try to squeeze it in quickly at the end here. So we're basically at the end of the lecture today. There's only one thing remaining for this lecture, which is? <laughs> and I made a deal with the mathematicians yesterday. <laughs> so today I'm going to make good on that deal. Yes. So <laughs> There's some passion. That's great. <laughs> OK. So, so this joke is about a group of guys, and they're going to a conference. It's three of them. 
um, and they walk down there. Uh, you guys maybe will be a bit surprised to learn that they're all physicists. <laughs> but they walk down to the train station and at the train station they meet another three guys. And you might also be surprised to learn that the three guys that they meet there are all mathematicians. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, they all have to buy tickets to go to the conference. So they go to the ticket office and the physicists each buy a ticket and the mathematicians are very confident. And they walk to the office and they only buy one ticket. And the physicists think, wow, this is amazing. And they say to the mathematician, don't you need three tickets? And the mathematician says, no, just watch what we do. And you can learn how to travel with just one ticket. <laughs> so the physicist says, OK. So they get onto the plane. As soon as the conductor comes to get the tickets, the mathematicians get up and they go to the toilet. And all three of them stand inside one toilet and they shut the door. Then when the conductor comes along, he gets to the toilet, he knocks on the door, Ticket, please. And the mathematicians just hand over one ticket. And the conductor takes the ticket, he clicks it, and he gives it back again. Then he leaves, and the mathematicians come out, and all three of them travel with one ticket. And the physicists look at this, and they think, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> so they all go to the conference. Now it's time to come home. And as chance would have it, the three physicists are again traveling with the three mathematicians. <laughs> Then the physicists go to buy the ticket and they only buy one ticket. <laughs> and they look at the mathematicians and the mathematicians don't buy any tickets. <laughs> and they think, wow, this is great. Then the conductor comes into the carriage and the physicist thinks, oh, we wish we could watch the mathematicians, but we have to go to now into the toilet. So all of the physicists go and they get into one uh, toilet and they shut the door. And then the mathematicians go and they go to the toilet next door. And then one of the mathematicians knocks on the door of the physicist and he says, Ticket, please. <laughs> okay, guys, that's it for today.